Good afternoon and welcome to the second of the We NATO live debates. Uh, today we're going to be talking about a, this book. It's The Age of the Unthinkable, Unthinkable by Joshua Cooper Ramo. It's a book which has been causing a big stir in foreign policy circles around the world because it calls on, uh, calls on major institutions, foreign policy, the foreign policy establishment, to, uh, to rethink the way they look at the world and to learn lessons from the most unlikely people, from uh, the Hezbollah in uh, Lebanon to startup companies in Silicon Valley and AIDS doctors in South Africa. It's really calling for a major rethink of the way institutions like NATO look at the world. And to discuss these issues, we have with us uh, today uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary General from NATO's Public Diplomacy Division, that's Dr. Stephanie Babst. And uh, joining us uh, by satellite link to, um, to Boston, we have Joy Ito, who's the uh, head of the Media Lab at the Massachusetts Institution, Institute of Technology. Uh, Joy Ito, who is a, a well-known uh, thinker about innovation and a fully paid-up member of the world's cyber elite. Uh, welcome, Joy. I hope you can hear us well uh, there in, uh, in Boston. So let's start off by talking about this book. Um, Stephanie Babs, if you could start off by telling us what, what were the main themes of this book which interest you and which you think are, are relevant to the work that NATO is doing these days? Well, first of all, let me say that I read the book because Joy introduced me to the book and said I should read it. And so I bought it and I read it. And I must say I really enjoyed reading it. Um, it's very thought-provoking. It's uh, very fast. And it's like a series of meetings uh, with highly interesting people. So the author takes the reader through a series of interesting uh, person um, that we are normally not um, inclined to meet, uh, from researchers in media labs to Hezbollah people to all these, these very interesting people. Um, and what I really like about the book is that uh, Joshua argues that the world has changed. Yes, that's very much true. It has become extremely complex. That's also very much true, that we need to become uh, differently in our thinking and the way we approach uh, the problems that we have at hand and that we should ultimately also become more connected. So I very much agree with the overall thesis of the book, um, even though I must admit I don't think it's an entirely new observation. I certainly don't know anybody who would argue that the world hasn't changed in the past 10, 15, 20 years. I think the, the key question is, what is it that we do with that observation? And how should governments, institutions, and ultimately also individuals cope with that? How can we respond to that? Mm. But in, in, in purely practical terms, I mean, there's a way of looking at this and thinking, mm. okay, in theory, it, it's beautiful. Mm. You have this kind of complex idea about the sandpile world mm. and small things can change big things. But in, in practical terms, are there any practical applications to how an organization like NATO, a big organization, political, uh, military alliance, how can you apply those kind of th thoughts and become more agile and more nimble in this fast-changing world? Well, I guess if you look back at NATO's um, past 20 years, we can already see that the organization has really tried uh, to adapt, to change, to transform. Um, and the organization that I'm employed now, right now, is certainly very much different than it was than 12 or 10 years ago. Um, just take one example, um, NATO's connectivity. Uh, we used to be, as you rightly say, during the Cold War years, uh, a rather static, defense-oriented um, organization, which was designed to deter and to do collective defense uh, in case of an attack. That core business is still our core business, but there is something that we have de uh, developed on, on plus, on, on top of it. And that is very much about uh, getting connected to other international players, be it nation state, be it NGOs, be it other international organizations. So if you would go around this house today and you knock at uh, the doors of the colleagues working here at the headquarters, I'd say that the majority of them works with other actors in one or the other way on partnership related issues, on security and defense sector reform, on human security, on building integrity, and all this certainly um, demonstrate that the organization has already transformed quite significantly. The question is still, uh, is this sufficient enough? I don't know, how should we do better? Should we do faster? Should we become more agile? And that's something that we can only do uh, very much aligned to the political issues that we have on our agenda. We can't do this in, in, in limbo because we are not operating in, in a political vacuum. Sure. And just coming back back to you there, Joy Ito, um, you, you've seen how these sort of, this sort of connect connectivity, this sort of fast change, fast moving uh, ad adaptation to to a, to a, to, a, to, a, to a, a dynamic 
situation, a dynamic market works in the media field. Do, do you see that there is a kind of direct relevance of that for NATO, that those kind of experiences uh, that you, you've seen in, in, uh, in innovation can, can be picked up by an international organization such as NATO? When you think about sort of military operations and things like that, that architecture is starting to go kind of to the edges. But still, I think when you start thinking about policy and diplomacy, it's still relatively centralized. And I think this power of pull, um, a lot of big um, companies all over the world are starting to think about um, architectures like that. If you look at the way Google is managed, if you look at the way many um, companies are now looking at innovation and thinking, they really are reaching to the edges of the network. Um, another example is, you know, in the old days, even Scotch um, 3M, they allowed, um, for instance, Scotch tape and post-its were designed not in the research labs. They were designed actually by people in the field who found a need and the company said, go ahead and work on it, even though they, they weren't the people who were tasked with the idea of coming up with products. And I think that you know, some, some of this um, um, is about empowering people throughout the organization to innovate and to come up with ideas. So, I mean, the cliche way of saying it is bottom up. Um, and then the, I think the other thing is to, um, we, we use the term peripheral vision a lot. So there's a study that shows that if you have a dot on, on the screen and um, you show things on the peripheral, people will see it. But if they, you give them a financial reward for watching the dot, they no longer see it as peripheral images. And when you focus, you lose sight of the stuff around you. You, know, you find this with um, pilots and anybody. And, and there's a, when, you, when you do, like for instance, um, talk to people who are very good hunters with arrows. What they say is the way that you learn how to hunt, to stop seeing, and then suddenly you can see all the little animals in your peripheral vision because you're no longer focused. But when you focus, all that stuff drops away. And I think what's really interesting when you think about an organization like NATO is to look at the opportunities to connect with this, you know, with Yemen or some other... And you think of a financial reward for watching the dots and you will no longer see this. Pick up those opportunities. And when you focus, I guess the metaphor for that would be how do you lose the focus? And the losing the focus is really about how do you allow, how do you sort of stop the conversation in your brain for a second? which is basically the central command. How do you loosen that every once in a while to let sound and ideas come from the edges? And I think that's going to be a, a, I think it's not impossible actually. It's just like we can learn how to meditate. I think a large organization can learn how to use its peripheral vision and some campus. And, and so that, that I think is a, is, 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 that's just a metaphor, but I think that you know, for NATO, and you're doing this now by using things like Google Plus and Hangouts and things, so I think it's an interesting opportunity. It's, it's interesting you mentioned we've got we've got a we've got an email in from from one of our viewers from uh, Syed Kamar Afzal Rizvi, Rizvi who who asks mm. uh, how how NATO can change the negative perception the negative image that it has in in the Islamic world in particular the idea that it's it's a that NATO is purely a tool of of American foreign policy mm -hmm. and I just wondered whether the sort of the sort of uh, new technology social networks these these sort of platforms that we're talking about mm -hmm. whether that is that is a somewhere where nato sees the future as a way of getting your message across mm -hmm. not only to the to the islamic world but to mm -hmm. to the world more generally mm -hmm. well i mean it's a, it's certainly true i mean that nato um, still has a negative connotated image in in large parts of the Arab world i certainly don't detest that um, and secondly it's perhaps also due to the fact that uh, government to government relations, our relations to the governments in these countries were very much the predominant activity for us. I mean, yes, we also um, maintained, uh, maintained uh, relations to NGOs, to parts of civil society in the past years, but I think uh, the focus was clearly on our government to government uh, relationship. And this uh, has changed, and I think, and I hope it will continue to change because the Arab awakening and the processes that we see in these countries uh, have certainly made one thing very clear, that people in these countries, um, they would like to be connected. They have, in fact, connected themselves already to the global international community. And social media or networks uh, or other internet fora, they really, really provide a good opportunity for NATO to also connect to them. So what I'm saying is that we need to uh, build a relationship to civil society actors in these countries, to various groups in these countries, um, in order to start getting to know each other and ultimately also do some practical projects and work, work jointly on some practical stuff, um, not in terms of 
NATO telling them what we want them to do, but, but rather to identify areas where we do have a common interest and say NATO stands ready to assist uh, if, if wanted. So um, that will be a, um, a gradual process. I don't think we can change our overall image overnight, but I think that with more people-to-people -people relationship, with more interconnectivity, quote-unquote, uh, between uh, the Arab world and us, um, that there should be a way in order to simply get to know each other better and also perhaps change perceptions overnight. Let me ultimately but say that whatever you can do on the communication side, on the soft power side, is certainly very, very important and very interesting, but more importantly is um, the political action. You know, you can't communicate the Middle East problem away. You can't communicate the problem away that we do currently have with uh, Iranian uh, nuclear ambition. Uh, so that requires a political solution. But it's certainly important to also establish more relations and more direct um, connectivity to, to the people in the countries. For sure. I mean, you, you mentioned uh, the the, uh, the Arab Spring, uh, Joyita. We we all we all saw that the, the the power that social social media can have during during the Arab the Arab Spring, uh, which started last year in, in Tunisia and spread very quickly to Egypt. Um, that was very much, as, as you mentioned yourself, a, a bottom a bottom up uh, arrangement, a grassroots movement. I just wonder whether whether big established institutional organizations such as NATO can harness that sort of that sort of power, that sort of dynamism that comes from uh, social media, or is it something that, that, that by its very nature remains as a sort of a grassroots uh, movement? So, so I would make a couple of points. I think that um, the idea of using social media to, um, as a tool for causing something, it's probably kind of difficult because social, what, what social media did in, in the Arab Spring is it took some um, disconnect between reality and what was going on and it collapsed and, you know, there was a tremendous amount of potential energy for these overthrows to happen but because of a number of factors they weren't happening you know, in, in Tunisia the, the media and the government was able to suppress all of the independent um, uprisings so they didn't know about each other and when the image of the self immolation went out through Facebook and then to Al Jazeera that lit the country on fire but it was already there was already potential there um, and the same with Egypt. Um, what I think that the one thing that's really important, like if I think about NATO, or if you go all the back, way back to the Cold War, the two sides, the Americans and the Russians, completely miscalculated the other side's capabilities. It was a failure in intelligence, I think. It, it cost both sides a tremendous amount of money, the whole world a tremendous amount of grief. And this is, a, you know, I guess you can tie some of the roots of NATO to that, um, to that period. But what's interesting for me is this intelligence is never good for anyone, you know. And so when the Americans miscalculated their um, you know, attempt on Iraq, that not only hurt America, it hurt the whole world, right? So I think that there is never a benefit for anyone in the world to have... in the interaction, right? But I think today with social media, the people are telling you exactly what they think. And it's a very important new source of intelligence that I think it's, in the old days, I think we called it open source intelligence, but I think it's a really important thing to factor into understanding these places. And I, I think that, you know, even journalists aren't used to publics that tell, that talk back to you. <laughs> They're used to studying. You know? And so I think that kind of thinking about the, the social media as the public talking to you rather than something that you have to evolve and study, I think is very important. Um, and, and somehow, the one other thing I would say, in addition to what Stephen said, that um, you know, human voice is very important um, in, de um, in humanizing the other side. I think this is another problem when we, we have, is when the, you know, the Arabs dehumanize NATO and NATO dehumanizes Arabs. That's when you start having this breakdown of trust. And even if it's a 
limited, uh, very uh, limited level at the beginning. I think having you know you appear on uh, a video like this, talk to you know, writing in global voices and things like that, I really applaud those efforts to reach out because I think that human voice, is, even if it's tough at the beginning and you get beat up a little bit, that's really important. And then calling those people and see your your world. And again, I think it's the, the less the less orchestrated it is, the more authentic it is. And I think that's the other key thing about social media is authenticity. I think that uh, if you can start speaking in an authentic voice, even if you don't agree, I think that will add tremendously to the, um, because everyone, no one gives you the benefit of the doubt when it's dehumanized. And, you know, the rumors in the Middle East about the West you know, are, are kind, some of them are quite over, over the top. You know? And so even just getting them to believe, even when they disagree that you're telling the truth, would be a huge step forward, I think. Thanks, Roy. Another point now, just broadening broadening the debate away from the, the purely me media focus. We had we had a question come in from uh, Venkat K uh, Kanaka Madala, who asks um, about NATO's response to the rise of the emerging new powers in the world, mm -hmm. the, the BRICS: uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. Mm -hmm. The emergence of these new these new powers in the world. That's that's one of the things that that uh, Joshua Ramo talks about in his book and. Surely that also demands a, a flexible approach from NATO and a, a, a reevaluation, if you like, of NATO of NATO's approach to the mm, world. Yeah. How, how, have, how has the emergence of these new power these new powers affected NATO, and how, how is NATO responding to this emergence? Well, we are affected by what is called emerging new powers, and I put in parentheses. I, I think that the term is a bit wrong because they are already there. I don't think they are emerging uh, because they are politically and. Uh, economically and also partly militarily already extremely powerful. But leaving that terminology issue aside, uh, obviously um, we are extremely interested uh, in pursuing their development. Uh, we keep on watching them as they do watch us. Uh, you may be very interesting to know how many Chinese uh, journalists come to our press conferences or watch whatever we do. So there is certainly an interest in China uh, but also in, in India to discover quote-unquote NATO. We've had an increasing number of direct contacts in the past, uh, people on senior political level as well as journalists and academics and thinkers uh, from those countries have knocked on our doors uh, to come here and to find out what we are actually up to, what we are thinking. There is not yet, especially with uh, Brazil or India, an established, structured political form of cooperation in place. But personally, I wouldn't exclude it as we move along in the next couple of years that if these countries make up their own mind, what is it that they want to do perhaps with NATO in terms of consulting or cooperating on some international security issues that they perhaps prefer to also make their relationship with us a little bit more formalized. But as I said, we are not yet there. For the time being, it's a um, getting to know each other um, issue. To a lesser degree with uh, Brazil, I recall that I had a visitor sitting in my office a good year ago who happened to be the presidential advisor. Uh, and to ask me about NATO AVEX um, and whether we could deploy that or could make that available for the uh, Olympic Games. Okay. Um, I mean, it was an informal request. I mean, yep. he didn't formalize it. But I thought it was interesting that somebody would travel all the way uh, from uh, Brazil in order to discover that NATO has a capability in place that perhaps could also be of interest to a country like Brazil. Hmm. So here we go. Yeah, it's very interesting. Joy, Joy I just wondered whether... Your experience, and you, you see how, how these new, uh, fast-growing uh, new powers like, like India, like Brazil, particularly China, the, the way they are, they are adapting to the, the new world situation, the, the, the new um, technological opportunities, uh, are they ahead of the curve? Are they leaving, leaving uh, those of us over here in Europe and in the United States behind? Well, I, I think that um, you know, basically, by definition, anywhere where you're building new things, like when Estonia was building its banks. They didn't have a lot of the old infrastructure, so they could build banks that were very, very internet smart. And so whenever you're building new infrastructure, you need probably old guys. So in any country where they don't have structure, they're going to have the difficulty at the beginning, but then they'll come up with something better. So almost by definition, these countries are going to have even um, legal um, frameworks to have the benefit of um, looking at others before they build theirs. So I think that's true. I think. Um, they have some similarities, but I think India, China, and Brazil are so completely different from a political perspective that it's very interesting to see the kind of innovation that's happening in China versus the kind of innovation that's happening in India and Brazil. And then 
also very interesting in places, places um, in Africa and other places where the exact sort of the, the, the lack of resources actually creates a really interesting ingenuity, for instance, in the way that they're architecting the networks and things like that for low power and low cost. So I think there's a tremendous amount of really interesting technical innovation, social innovation. And I think if you look at China, for instance, I mean, if you look at the government and the way that the social networks are starting to allow a little bit of um, dissent to come out, and the relationship between the Chinese government um, publicly saying that they are using these social networks as a way for the citizens to talk to them. It's very kind of, it, and it's hard to tell how authentic it is, but it definitely is making a change. When the Chinese, when that um, train wreck happened, there were you know, millions of comments on the social networks and the government at least acted like it was listening. So it's very interesting to see China's relationship with social media and also sort of um, India kind of struggling with, its, with, with all its deregulation. Regulation. Um, so I, I think it's tremendously interesting, but the, I think the, um, the, the good news for us is that we can also, these are, they're building, well not so much China, but they will, they will start to build global companies and global technologies that hopefully will help us connect together. So I, I, I'm, I'm you know, cautiously optimistic, you know, I think the main thing that I worry about a little bit is um, that, uh, um, um, you know, I, I've been involved very much in, in um, organizations like ICANN that works on names and numbers and on internet governance. And there's always been a fear that some countries will want to split off the internet. And, and I'm very interested in keeping the internet whole. And uh, we've had threats from the Arab League or from the Chinese that, hey, if we don't get more control, we're going to fork away. And, and that's my fear it is, is that we, we break up this, uh, this kind of global community if they get too strong and it's here. So far, you're not, they're not say, seeing any signs of that happening, or is that something you fear could be a... Uh, it, it, it emerges yeah, occasionally, but I think we're okay right now. Yeah, okay. Just, I mean, we talked about, we live in an interconnected mm. world, world. That's very much one of the themes of, of Joshua Rammel's book, that things that happen in one country have an, an impact in another country that are, we're completely unprepared for. I think we, may, we maybe have a sign of that now in Mali. You know, we, uh, the, Gaddafi was toppled in Libya, Several months later, the, his Tuareg fighters have found their way back home. They've destabilized what had been one of the steadiest democracies in Africa, and now we have Al-Qaeda apparently taking over vast swathes of the north of that country. How does, how does NATO cope with that kind of unpredictability, that, that, that kind of interconnect, interconnectivity that we have, that regions are, are now so, so, so interconnected in ways that we maybe never thought of before? Well, I'd say, I mean, we should have thought about this. Uh, before you actually engage in a political or a military action, you need to think, at least to a certain degree, your possible follow-up action through, uh, the impact, the possible effects of that uh, through. And I can assure you that in NATO's planning, be it political planning or in military planning, we always include that type of what could be the possible effects question. Um, I think, however, that to be realistic, there is a limit to how much you can actually forecast, uh, which leads me to um, just share with you um, a very, very impressive number um, that I found from a Berkeley professor who's called Peter Teckel, and he did a research on um, forecasts, on prognosis, uh, and he studied uh, throughout a time frame of 10 years more than 53,000 different prognoses that were made by more than 280-something uh, experts, all of them very eager to put their prognoses, their forecasts into the media, into the public, uh, sometimes really with major headlines. And funnily, quote-unquote, or realistically, the end result is that their overall targets were lower than that of a random generator. So in other <laughs> words, I, I, th I think we need to be a little bit realistic when it comes to our own ability to forecast but simply, as, as Joy has pointed out already, and this is also a point that uh, I think Joshua make, makes in his book, to be then flexible enough and adaptive enough in order to quickly react to that unforeseen change, for instance, in Mali or in another neighboring country, and not stand by and watch it with big eyes and, and an open mouth and say, oh, I never expected that. So I think it's this responsiveness, the degree of responsiveness that the international system, governments as well as actors need to... Um, become better with in terms of um, coping with these uh, unforeseen uh, developments. But 
but trying to make a forecast uh, and and a prognosis, I don't think this is something which is extremely bound to be successful. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Having having dished the forecasters, I'm going to ask you to wrap up now by looking at, looking ahead to the future and making your own predictions. Uh, the, the book uh, Joshua Ramos' book talks a lot about the the um, the battle between good innovation and bad innovation. And despite all the the dangers and the unpredictability that he talks about, he's basically optimistic. He thinks that good innovation handled the right way is is going to is going to always trump bad innovation. Do, do you agree with that optimism? Uh, let's let's start with the joy. Yeah, so um, I, 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 I think about it, it, it's a system. I, I think about it, the, the metaphor for me is it, we're like a biological system, like a child. And the child, when the child is growing, gets sick, will fall, hurt itself. But through every failure and every um, you know, accident, the child learns and builds an immune system, builds intelligence, and it evolves into a, a, a hopefully a, a wonderful adult. And I think what we're going through is this kind of period right now where we have mistakes and we're learning and we're adapting into a complex environment. And you don't make a child stronger by not exposing it to germs or by putting it in a padded cell or by forcing it to be under control. You teach a child by letting it play and the child starts to learn. And I think what we're developing right now is a new kind of consciousness, a new kind of complex system which we have. And it's a very tough time right now because it's the first time we're kind of falling, stumbling around on our own. And so, so I'm optimistic because I believe that we have a resilient system where um, the, you know, the, the people are generally good and it's trying to learn its way. But I think we're going to bump our head a few more times before we, we, <laughs> we know how to walk. Well, I agree with Joy. I guess, I mean, we will get bumps on our head. Uh, regrettably, some of these bumps will be very, very uh, painful uh, and perhaps even deadly for some people. So I think we'd need to certainly... Um, be optimistic in the sense that we um, uh, that that we should not doubt our own ability to cope with uh, with these uh, complex uh, environments and these many challenges that we are faced with. We need to be perhaps a little bit more imaginative, and for organizations such as NATO, but I think this applies for other international organizations and bureaucracies alike. I personally like to see them becoming a little bit more um, open to taking risk. Um, I think this um, um, this tendency of remaining on one line and following one procedure and uh, sticking to a rather restricted set of rules um, is uh, useful to a certain extent, but then really you need to become a little bit more open. But my overall prognosis <laughs> uh, is certainly uh, to, uh, yeah, uh, that we have a lot of uh, good tools in our hand, including social media, um, including our own smartness, including a generation which is interested in, in, in politics, a younger generation included, that should give us the ability in order to come up with, with some smart answers to a number of very tough questions. Okay, great. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll, check, we'll check back in the future and see whether that prognosis is correct uh, as, <laughs> as, the other, as, as the other ones. So, uh, once again, thank you very yeah, much. Joy Ito in Boston, Stephanie Babs here You're in welcome. NATO. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Bye, Bye Joy.